Yes, David Ellsworth is uh, heading off into retirement, but delighted to say that the man next to me is still going strong. Uh, young Tom Scudamore. Tom, thank you very much for coming in today. Um, how have you been? It's been a, a, a trying time, I think, for you, looking from a distance, and uh, you can perhaps uh, enlighten us a little bit more. Yeah, it's, um, it's been a, you know, an interesting time the last few weeks, but... Um, it's been, you know, it's been well documented, all the things that have been happening, and um, I say hopefully at some point we'll all be able to move on. Well, you were scheduled to come on here to talk about lots of things, obviously, including your own career, but obviously what has happened has meant that it's, it's inevitable that we're going to have to talk a little bit about it. Uh, obviously, the Briony Frost, Robbie Dunn situation, we might as well deal with that head-on first of all. Um, your name, your personal relationship with Briony came up into the, in, in the case during the, the, the way it all panned out. Um, if you don't want to talk about your personal relationship, I can understand that, but it did come up in the conversation. How are things at the moment between yourself and her, and, and is it worthy of all this discussion? Yeah, um, look, obviously what was said during the hearing um, was said. Um, I have a different account to what Bryony said. Um, we have spoken since the, um, since the uh, hearing as well, um, but I say, you know, she felt that I ostracised her, um, and I didn't feel that was the case. Um, but as I said during the hearing, I was certainly wary of things that have been put in the press on, on the lead up to um, to the case, as it were, um, and just a few things I sort of felt uncomfortable about. But um, as I say, you know, the case wasn't about me; it was about yeah. Robbie and Bryony. Um, and as I say, hopefully we can all move on. Speaking of the case being about Robbie and Brian, obviously the, the decision came last week at Cheltenham, or last weekend at Cheltenham. Uh, emotions were running high in the weighing room. Lots of, lots of people felt that their way of life was being challenged, by threatened. Uh, the perception of the weighing room was not what they would wish it to be. Um, and perhaps people said things in the heat of the moment. First of all, have tempers simmered down somewhat, the temperature cooled down, and are people beginning to see a clearer picture of, of what's going on? Um, I think it's a case of you know, the judgment is what it is. You, you, know, you have to accept the judgment is by an independent panel, and you know, that, that, that isn't up for discussion. I still think there's some simmering anger within the weighing room, a lot about how, um, how certain things were reported, and especially more in the lead-up to the case, you know, the leaks and, and what have you. Um, and I think there are a lot of questions that haven't been answered in, in that respect. Um, so again, I, I think that the, the anger within the weighing room is more, you know, with how certain things were reported um, rather than the actual case itself. But again, in, in, a, in, in you know, it's a highly emotive issue. Mm. Um, you know, it's been a, it's been a very trying time for everybody, you know, especially for those, those directly involved. Um, but I say hopefully at some point there'll be closure for everybody. Are there any regrets amongst the Professional Jockeys Association, the body of the Professional Jockeys Association, in things that have been said since the case? Are there any regrets, do you think, as one of the senior members of the weighing room, in, in the way things have been handled since the verdict has come out? Um, I think that, you know, again, it, it's, a, it's a hard situation for the PGA. I'm not, you know, I'm not a board member. Um, I'm part of the sort of um, advisory group for the for the jump jockeys, um, but I'm not a, not a board member. But you know, at the same time, they they're in a position where you know they it's between two of their own members, so they have to be balanced. Um, but unfortunately, in a case like this, you know, everybody has varying varying views, and it's very very hard to stay neutral. One thing that people obviously want to to do going forward is to perhaps have a clearer indication of whether or not there are things in the wearing that needs to be changed. The case suggested, or didn't suggest, it, it, it says that things need to be better. That's what the verdict of the case suggested. Um, do you feel that that is something that is going to happen in light of it? Is there an acceptance in the, in the wearing room that that is going to happen, that things could be better and we're going to make it better? I think it's certainly in the case for the, for the, for the ladies um, in the changing rooms and what have you, you know, that, 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 that has been something that has been needed to change for quite a long time. Um, I think Paige Fuller did a report a few years ago. Um, the BHA said at the time that they and the race courses would act upon, um, but frankly, you know, their facilities compared to the male Part, you know, counterparts um, are very, very poor, and that's been the case for, for many years. Whether this will be the thing that will 
get action done. Um, and it's very sad it's got to this point for the action to be taken. Yeah. Um, but it's it's certainly the the, the waking waking up call that people really need to to, to make change, especially you know, for the for the ladies' facilities because they haven't changed in the 20 years I've been riding, yeah. and there are so many more lady riders now than than there even were 10 years ago, and they deserve much better. Yeah, Megan Nichols actually was uh, telling me yesterday that changes have already been made at Ascot to make things a little better with the with the way the facilities are set up for both uh, male and female our riders. Uh, a bit more about last thing I want to ask you because I know we want to move on <clears throat> but the, the culture of the wearing room is anything in the culture of the wearing room worthy of change in your opinion the way that things are, are normally handled the way that people senior jockeys conduct themselves with the younger riders etc is there anything that needs to change there? there's always things that need to change and need to improve um, I suppose you know the way I was thinking about it quite recently was maybe it's a case you, know, you look at the great Sir Alex Ferguson how he, he dealt with things and the way he would deal with the Roy Keynes, Brian Robsons of this world, eventually he couldn't do the same thing with the David Beckhams and Cristiano Ronaldos. Um, so yeah, things move on, things things do change, and look, everybody has to get better. It's it's, it's as simple as that. Um, but you know, as I say that that's that's the, the nature of life. Things move on, and, and you've got to try and adapt and, and get better every day. And to close this off, <clears throat> do you feel that? In time, there will be a, a chance for, for Bryony to become part of the weighing room and everyone to, to get on as things perhaps once were, or is that going to be a very difficult thing to do considering the way things have panned no, out? No, there's always options there for, for everybody, and um, you know, I never felt it was a case of people trying to ostracise anybody. Um, I think that was something that was, that was reported on, and, and, and certainly you know, everybody has you know, different feelings and, and different. Um, you know um, experiences of, of that, um, but uh, you know I, I've always found that the, the weighing room, um, from my view, has, has always been very open, very welcoming to me. And yes, um, you know it, it, it's it's a case of I, I think there there there, you know, there 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 will always be be a place for, for everybody, um, and yeah, we've just got to, we've got to get it better. Indeed. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit about Tom Scudamore because uh, uh, when it comes to this time of the year, there are lots of good memories for you. Of course, we were sitting outside just a few moments ago talking about thistle crack, etc. Uh, you were in action yesterday at uh, Haydock and you were back on a horse who a lot of people thought might win the Tommy Whittle remastered. Let's just briefly reflect on how you felt uh, he got on yesterday when finishing second. He ran a fantastic race. Obviously, he had to give a lot of weight to an improving young horse in the winner. Um, but he's, you know, he's a fine horse. He's, he should know ill effects um, from his nasty tumble in the Labrook, and I'm sure there'll be plenty more, more days to come. Um, say at this point in the race, I thought we were going to win. He jumped the third last and second last very well. Um, we just had no more to offer um, when Charlie Hammond has come to us. But um, as I say, there's this, there'll be plenty of big days and remastered. Um, he's done fantastically well so far, and he'll continue to, to fly the flag for Pond House. Just as an individual, the fall he took in the Ladbrokes Trophy, it, it looked a brutal fall. I mean, he you know, looked as if a, a lot of horses that could have a, a serious a long-term effect on their mental state. How, how difficult was it for him to bounce back and did he just brush that off very easily at home? Yeah, he, he did a lot of intensive schooling back at, back at David's. Um, obviously, you know, he was a bit stiff and sore after he'd had his fall, um, but you know, everybody had worked very hard um, in order to put him back in the right place. Um, he, I say he'd done plenty of schooling mm. and actually he was a little bit tentative to begin with, but his confidence soon came back. And as you can see from the way he jumped on Saturday, um, he, he showed no ill effects and you know, he's back, certainly back um, on, on track. What do you think would be, considering where we are in the season, what do you think would be a, a really good target for him between now and the end of the traditional um, season? Yeah, uh, again, look, there's, there's, there's lots of options there for him. Um, you know, he's handled Cheltenham before in the past, so um, I'm sure that you know, perhaps a race like the Ultima um, mm. would be taken into consideration, but you know, any, any high class Saturday, three mile plus chase, um, he's going to be there or thereabouts. Yeah. Well, he's an exciting horse for you to look forward to. An another one that we were hoping to see in the Greatwood was Adagio. Um, sadly, he couldn't make it. Is he A OK? And, and B, when are we next likely yeah, to see? As far as I'm aware, he's fine. I say he ran a great race in the Greatwood. It was a shame um, he couldn't run at Cheltenham last weekend. Um, but I say he just had a little setback. 
um, but I'm certain he'll be back very shortly. And I say you know, he's, a, he's a high quality horse, you know, four year old. Um, he had a great season last season and, and certainly looked like he trained on in the Greatwood. That was, a, that was a fantastic performance and one we were all very excited about. Yeah, sorry, thank you. He did run a good race <laughs> in the Greatwood. Um, but it was the, the race last weekend at Cheltenham that he missed. Thank, you dealt with that beautifully. You should be sitting in this chair, Tom, and I should be sitting over there. Um, uh, just thinking about some of your other rides potentially around Christmas time, and you mentioned Brinkley potentially going to. Yeah, Brinkley, um, I, you know, he, he could get an entry, I imagine, in the Feltham, um, but that's going to be, by the looks of things, a red hot race. Yes. Um, but he took to chasing very well um, at Huntingdon. I thought it was a, a cracking performance um, on a track that wouldn't have suited on ground that would have been too fast for him. Um, and again, he's, he's an exciting horse in the future. He's a real stayer, and when the mud starts to fly, you're going to see the best of him. Yeah, we are going to come back to the Feltham to talk about one horse in particular that I know you have a very close eye and you can uh, cast a little bit more light on, on the belief behind a horse called Ahoy Senior um, that your dad is obviously heavily involved in. But let's talk a little bit about, about Tom Scudamore. Uh, next year, Tom, it's incredible to say, but you're, you're going to be 40, is that right? <laughs> That's correct, um, yeah. yeah, it's yeah been... Whisper it. <laughs> 21 again, I prefer the term. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously you, you've been around now for, for for a very long time. Was it more than more than two decades ago? You rode your you rode your first winner. You've had this very long relationship with first of all Martin, now David Pipe. That's um, that's been fantastic over a very long period of time. When you look at your career now, to when you started off, you know, a quarter of a century ago, if you don't mind me saying. I mean, what? How do you summarize your achievements? Um, I'm very proud of what I've achieved so far, but I'm not the sort of person that really looks back. Um, I'm always looking forward, so um, you know, I'm just one of those people that when, it, when it's done, it, it, it's happened. Um, hopefully I have lots of time to mm. reminisce. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what I've achieved, but um, it doesn't feel like it's actually happened. It's just, you know, say as soon as it's happened, you're, you're on to the next one. Well, when I look through some of your achievements and look at the horses that you've been associated with, and I think a lot of a lot of racing fans like myself would look back through these horses and a riding career is sort of defined by your your partners. And one of the horses that I think was instrumental in bringing you up the ladder very quickly was dear old Lock Derg, um, a horse that you had a, a tremendous relationship with. And you could perhaps give us a little bit more insight into his personality. <laughs> yeah, he was a fantastic horse, um, very laid back, as you could see from his from his races. Um, he wasn't built like a race horse. He was like <laughs> one of those horses that his front end was very different from his from his back end. Um, but he could gallop and he could try and he gave me some fantastic days. And, and the other thing with, with Lockdown, he was so durable. I think he became so popular because he was running every Saturday, mm. whether they were handicaps uh, or graded races, and he was always competitive. Um, okay, he might have just fallen short in world hurdles. He couldn't um, ever really get competitive in that, but he won grade one races, grade two races. And you know, I think the, the style in which he ran you know, from the front, all, all guns blazing. Yeah. Um, he dropped back a little bit and, and often come flying back at the end. So, you know, he was just one of those horses that, 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 that I think the public appreciated and um, it certainly felt that way. I've always wondered about the science about riding a horse like Lockdown because obviously he was well loved by a lot of people. There was no science. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. No science. Well, exactly. It was get a good start and improve your position from there. <laughs> exactly. That was the thing because you had horses like Harchibolt who used to travel really easily on the bridle, did a lot of the work for the rider. I used to think with Lockdown, it was the rider who, who needed more because you, 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 he challenged you. Yeah, he he did. Uh, but it, what I loved about riding Lockdurg was that there was you know you, you'd go out and I mean, you you have a plan for every race. But it's more of a case of if I am in touch at this point in the race, I will keep on galloping. Yeah. Whether the other was around you. Know, so for instance, when you ride around Ascot, if you're in front going to Swinley Bottom or within two lengths at Swinley Bottom, you knew you'd probably win because he could gallop from Swinley Bottom to the winning line yeah. quicker than just about any horse I've ever ridden. So um, <laughs> it, there, were, there, there were those sort of things. You know, well, if you're in touch at the bottom of the hill at Cheltenham, he would keep on galloping. So you know, th those are the things you had in mind, not necessarily tactics, was that you've just got to try. You know, If you keep on trying, he will keep on responding for you. Uh, he won the long walk for you years ago. You also won it with a, another horse who did pretty well around Christmas time in Thistlecrack. He was slightly different. <laughs> I was about to say, in terms of raw ability, would, would Thistlecrack be the best? Yes, undoubtedly. Um, he, the best horse I've, I've ever had the association with. Um, I was very lucky. I rode well chief in his first novice hurdle, which was a great thrill. Um, but you know, Thistlecrack, um, for about 18 months, was nigh on impossible to beat. Um, I was very lucky to get on him uh, at Aintree in his novice hurdle, and then 
well, that was for grade one and we won five more grade ones and I think ten races in total and this was just a, a fabulous day. You think that was his fourth run over fences. He'd yeah. had his first run um, at the end of October that year and he ends up winning the King George two months later. Um, it, it was a great credit to everybody. You know, he wasn't the easiest to train for Colin and, and Joe and, and, and all, all the team there. Um, he always had physical issues. So to get him fit and healthy for as long as they did um, was great. And uh, I say, I'm a bit embarrassed by that little moment. <laughs> that was my, my daughter said to me yesterday, why were you celebrating before you crossed the line? But um, it's... We'll have uh, a closer it, look at it, I think. That's yeah, I, I don't mind looking at it again. <laughs> it's all right. Um, but no, he was... It was just a, a fantastic day. And, um, you know, unfortunately, that was, that was the last win as it turned out of his career. But. You know, what a what a wonderful racehorse! And you talk about temperaments. He was he was so laid back. He's a real joy. And you know, Heather Snook sent me some pictures of him the other day in his retirement, and he still looks as magnificent then and now as he as he did then. Well, we often talk about this time of the year. You know, the King George is one of those iconic races uh, for you to win it on on, on Thistlecrack, and and the start that he did it as well because he he had the race won a long way out. He did. Um, I'd like to think he'd had it won when we, uh, me and Paddy schooled up sides each other about three weeks earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Paddy was on Native River, I think he was trying to um, prove a point and Thistlecrack was unbelievable. So um, that, that, yeah, that, I think that he, he'd won the race from three weeks beforehand. Yeah. Uh, he was a he was a, a superb racer. So we mentioned that obviously, and uh, the world hurdle amongst others. Um, there were some other very smart horses that you rode, and I'd, I'd like to pick up on a couple of them. And Grand Crew, you were telling me about Grand Crew, and again focusing on on Kempton at Christmas time. His performance in the in the Felton might have been one of the best things you've ever. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, the quality of the field that he beat, Silvniarco Conti was second, Bobsworth was third. I mean, you've got. A dual King George winner uh, and a Gold Cup winner in behind. You know, Silvniarco Conti to beat him as <laughs> impressively as he did around Kempton on his home track. Um, again, another horse that was unfortunately plagued by by issues um, in the end. But this day he was very very smart, and he is he's the sort of one horse you think back during your career and looking at things, thinking what what could have been. Um, he was as good over hurdles as he was over fences. Um, and you know, we got to see the best of him that day, but unfortunately, he was a shooting star. He was a superb racehorse, as you said. Uh, uh, there was another a grey that you rode as well for for David in, in Dinast, who was uh, pretty special, and he he gave you one of your Cheltenham Festival victories. He he was one of my most favourite horses to ride. Um, he was an extraordinary horse because. Um, he's bought very cheaply from France. I remember when, when David bought him, he'd worked well at home. He did everything right, and we were trying to find all the things. It was too good to be true that this, all, this sort of cheap buy from France was showing so much. Um, and as it turned out, you know, he was. He was a fantastic horse, and um, so tough. As good a jumper of a fence on the race course as I've ever ridden. Terrible jumper of a fence at home. Um, we stopped schooling him in the end because he'd keep cutting himself and things would go wrong because schooling at home, he was, he was terrible yet. You love a race. celebration. Yeah, I get, I get quite excited. <laughs> um, but no, that was that was that was that was a fantastic, fantastic day, and I was delighted for for the horse because he'd been taking on cue cards and Sylvania mm. Contis and um, hadn't quite beaten them. But that was his his day in the sun, and so richly deserved. And those Cheltenham Festival wins, you, know, you just won the King George. You just showed you winning on Thistlecrack. The, the 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 atmosphere at Cheltenham. Describe the the difference, or is it very similar to you know winning a big race like the King George? How does it? Um, any, to be honest, it's going to sound really boring, but I get a thrill from whatever winner I ride. Um, obviously, you know, if you ride one of those big races, you, you, it gives you the buzz of, off the crowd and things. But um, you know, it, it, it just I just get a, such a thrill from riding winners and being able to do what I do and and and, and love. So um, it's you know. You get to show off a little bit more on the bigger occasions, perhaps, but okay. you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what it is. You, know, you get such well, a thrill. I'm going to test that assertion yeah. by asking you about the thrill and how that compared to all the other ones that you just talked about when you won the Grand Annual on <laughs> Next Sensation. <laughs> there was that, that was more of an emotional thing because um, the, my grandparents had uh, passed away um, in a short space of time um, the previous summer. Um, so the, this horse, which was trained by my brother, um, it was owned by the son of my grandparents' best friends, um, and Mark Blanford, um, who grew up with Dad. You know, it, it was one of those things where 
you sort of think this, this, this cannot happen. How can people in a family that have been associated together for 70 years grow up and, and be around with each other? You know, um, Roy Blanford and, and my father, uh, my grandfather Michael, you know, were proper old muckers, bestest of friends, you know, for their grandchildren, children to have achieved something like that, you know, it, it, it was extraordinary, you know, you, you just couldn't believe it. So that, that was, that was a, a thrill, but more from an emotional side of it. I was going to say, I can't imagine that the stars have aligned at any other point in your career as they did on that occasion. I don't know, you've had, you say, 10 Cheltenham Festival wins, Thistlecrack, etc., but when it comes to things falling in place for something that means so much as that And it, it was extraordinary. You couldn't believe how things had fallen into place for him because the year before he'd won, I think, three chases on the, on the bounce. He went to the Grand Annual with a you know, great form with the cracking chance and finished fourth. The next year, everything had gone wrong for him. He mm. was lifeless at home. He went and did a piece of work um, bef about three weeks before the Cheltenham Festival and was, and was frankly embarrassing. Um, worked with some really moderate horses and was tailed off behind them. Um, the only time in that whole year he was right was the week leading up to the Cheltenham Festival. Yeah. You, you just couldn't make it up. It was extraordinary. Um, and, yeah, it was, it was the stars were aligned. He made a terrible mistake at the last of the circuit to go. Nine times out of ten, I'd have fallen off him. But um, just everything, every, it was, say, something's just written in the stars, and, and that was it. And what was it like being in the winner's enclosure after the race? Um, it was quite amusing because it was AP's last ride, so everybody was sort of more looking at the horse that finished fourth, so yeah. we were all able to have um, a nice, you know, nice quiet celebration <laughs> whilst everybody was was cheering AP. So and then in a way that was actually that that made it even more sweet. It made it much more private, and yeah. um, that was it was it was lovely. Well, Cheltenham seems to define so many personalities in the sport: the successes, the the victories, the heartache. Um, I don't know how to describe the giant bolsters run in the Gold Cup. Would that be heartache? Would there be pride and? That extraordinary race all those years ago? Um, a bit of everything. Um, pride in that he, you know, he, he could perform to his absolute maximum and he was a different horse around Cheltenham than he was everywhere else. Mm. Um, heartbreak because if there was one race in my career I'd like to go back and do again, it, it would be that. And actually heartbreak for you know, his owners, you know, mm. Simon Hunt, um, is a fantastic bloke. David Bridgewater trained just down the road from Cheltenham and I've known him all my life. Um, and it would have been you know, would have been a fairy tale, but you know, yeah. they say that's the it didn't quite work out in that respect. But um, you know, but pride pride in his performance, but heartache in the result. And when it comes to races that you want to put on Tom Scudamore's CV, uh, how desperate are you to get that? Yeah, I, it'd be be a lovely position to be in. I'll More so than the Nash. Nash um, Beggars can't be choosers either. <laughs> either, either. Either will do. Be a nice opportunity either. But um, look, you just want to ride the best horses, and um, the best horses generally run in the Gold Cup. Yeah, of course. Um, a little bit more about the the pipe relationship, if that's okay, because obviously you you got the opportunity to ride for for Martin, um, and you've been associated. Obviously, your, your family have been associated with them for such a long time. I mean, what what's that relationship been like? How has it? Changed, altered in any way over the years, and and how important are are the families to each other? I've been very fortunate um, to have been based down at Pond House you know, with Martin, and then with David. Um, with Martin, first of all, you know, to go straight from school to go and work for Martin um, was the defining moment of of my life. You know, the way I think, the way that he would treat um, the young aspiring jockeys and and staff um, through the yard was. Fantastic, and you know, I learnt so much off him and being around him and being around the yard at that time. Um, you know, and and I suppose the the not just his record on the track, which is you know <laughs> beyond discussion, but you see the people that have come through the ranks that have worked for him, um, and you know it's not just what they've gone and achieved, but the way they go and conduct themselves um, and the way they behave. You know, is is really great, great credit to Martin. He's, you know, he. he all the way through, he, he demanded the best of you. Um, you know, there were no easy days, and um, you know, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, and you know, working for David um, has been, you know, I've been, been so very fortunate uh, to have worked with him. Um, you know, we trust each other implicitly, and um, you know, I, I, uh, you know, the, the winners speak for themselves. So just marrying up a couple of things that I said to you earlier on about the fact that you turn uh, 40 next year. 
you've had all this experience in the sport. You know, when does Tom Scudamore start thinking about something other than riding? Is is that too far away to even think about? Have you made any? Uh, you've, you've got to be realistic. You know, I know, I know. I might look like Peter Pan. <laughs> um, so you've got to be realistic, but I'm enjoying riding as much as I have, I have done. Um, touch wood, you know, I'm, I'm fit, I'm healthy. So as long as that continues, then you know, hopefully I've got plenty more years in me left. Um, but you know, all the way through, you know, the, there are very few jockeys that get to choose when to say thank you very much. You know, um, and it doesn't matter how successful you are. So um, you know, my mother drilled that into me but through my education yeah. so I've always had backup I always have you know all the way through my career I've always had little things I'm interested in yeah. and, and and things so um, when the dreaded day either comes or I'm told to then um, you know I've got got lots of fingers and lots of pies as it were that, that okay. I will be able to move seamlessly through so training might be one of those parts? training won't be one of those okay. but um, I will be involved in in training at that you know, through through some avenue or another. Okay, interesting. Um, speaking of which, now your father, obviously, very successful jockey, uh, involved in a very successful training operation, and involved with potentially a superstar. You know as well as I do that a lot of people are very excited about Ahoy Senor. And you have observed, you've obviously spoken to, to your dad and to the family about this horse. I mean, what are your own thoughts about this? Because he could run at Kempton. The plan is to run him at Kempton in the uh, Corto Stars it is now against uh, Brave Man's Game and possibly Brinkley. I mean, yeah, who knows? No, my first thought was one of enormous jealousy <laughs> <laughs> when you watch him go around. Um, he's just such an athlete. And, he, and, and when you see him on the track, he is you know, he's so athletic, yet you get next to him in his box. Myself and Richie McLernan went to see him. We were, we were up at Perth in the summer. and. He is such a tank of a horse. You know, we, we went in and stood next to him, and you know his his aura about him. You know, he's a you know he's a he's a fabulous horse. And to be fair to Dad, you know, he said before he won at Aintree that he thought this was a, as good a horse as he'd ever had to deal deal with. And um, you know, I thought that's that's not a statement he normally makes. He does make statements like that, but that's generally after timing, and normally he's wrong. So <laughs> the fact that he's made this statement before he went to one is Grade One. Um, I thought that was that was a little bit different, and everything that Ahoy's yeah. gotten and, and done, he's proven Dad right so far. Who are you comparing him to when we were chatting before we? Came? Well, just the way he goes about it, um, he reminds you, and the way he looks actually, and, and the way he was in his box, he reminded me an awful lot of Thistlecrack. He's just a, a really strong, yeah. big horse, and yet so light on his feet when he's when when it matters. Are, are we wrong to to hype him up as much as we are, and people talking about him for the Gold Cup and? Uh, 2023, etc. Yeah, but that's that's the nature of the sport. We see it time and time again. Um, and so far, everything that he's done, he's exceeded expectations. So whilst he carries on doing that, people will keep on talking. But luckily for the racehorses, they do their talking on the track. Yeah. Um, a little bit more about uh, you know your experiences in in the sport. If we, can, we I know we're running out of time, and there's so much on this list that I, I want to talk to you. But <laughs> you, you've been in the game for too long, Tom, to talk about all these things. Just a, a bit about how it's changed. I, I, I'd love to know how things have changed. And you know, when you started off, the way training was done was different. The way I guess the weighing room. I know we've talked about it uh, somewhat at the top of the show. The way the weighing room has been has been different. I mean, what would be the things in your time in the sport? And I say, you know, m more than a quarter of a century as a working in the sport. The things that you feel have worked. The things that you feel could be better. Um, the things that have worked. The, the, I think um, jockey coaches um, have been a fantastic thing um, you know I, I was in a very fortunate position that obviously I always had dad to speak to um, and look there's a lot of jockeys that have come through the same way I have done you mm. know, Ruby Walsh's and you know, John Joe now and things that have you know, through family and what have you um, they've always had somebody to, to talk to but the fact that now everybody um, has that I think is fantastic I think the way but it's the same in any sport the way we look after ourselves is, is better now than the when I first arrived um, on the scene but then again to say that you know, that, that's been revolutionised is to do Richard Dunwoody, Peter Scudamore, John Frankham a disservice because yeah. you know, of their era they were absolutely you know, top professional um, athletes. Um, but I think it probably runs a bit deeper now than, than it did uh, when I first started. Um, things that have gone wrong, things that could be improved, my, I could have a list as long as my arm. Um, I think unfortunately in racing 
that uh, there are too many factions that spend far too many time arguing amongst each other mm. rather than trying to achieve what is best for the sport. I find it extremely sad that the likes of Martin Pipe, you know, Peter Easterby, John Frankham, people that have wealth of experience, great minds, are never asked for an opinion. Um, and there's so much that we can improve. There's an awful lot we get right, and there's an awful lot um, we should be extremely proud of. I think the welfare side of the horses, for example, you know, we're second to none. It's absolutely fantastic, and rightly so, but that's, that's something that, that should be there. Um, but I think that in, in, in management, um, there, there's a, a, a lot that, that, that could go wrong. And I think that you know, prize money issues is something people keep banging on about, but it is an issue. It's not going to go away. It needs to be sorted. Um, and you know, that, that once, once you get that sort of thing right, it, it all trickles down through. Yeah, it sounds like uh, in hopefully not too long to come, they could perhaps tap into the, the mind of uh, the young mind still, the young uh, Tom, Tom Scudamore. Uh, Tom, we're just about to wrap things up. So just before I go, what, what does Christmas time mean to, to you, obviously? Uh, Early mornings, family, waking up, <laughs> excitement. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's always been and a really exciting time. I, I love Christmas. I'm always a big child around Christmas. Um, and the most exciting part of it, you know, personally, seeing all the children, but professionally, mm. um, I normally have something to look forward to um, just after Christmas, whether it's Boxing Day or yeah. Welsh National Day. There's always so much to look forward to, always so much around the corner. And um, as long as I keep on getting excited by things around the corner, um, life will be, continue to be very good. Well, it's been an absolute joy to have you in here, Tom. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for your honesty in discussing uh, some of the subjects that we have. And we wish you the very best of luck. Have a Merry Christmas. And uh, long may you stay in the <laughs> saddle before you start putting your finger in pies left, right, and centre. <laughs> uh, Tom Scudamore, thank you very much. Rich, thank you. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.